So yeah, what I want to be talking about today is how we've used Studio V3 to integrate the Studio into a Next.js app to have a really seamless editorial experience for editors that want to create their own sales journeys, basically. So first of all, hey to everyone joining. Nice to meet you all. Um, about me, I'm the founder and CTO of Kickstart.ds. We're building a starter kit for design systems, and I'm also the CTO of Wumesmile, the agency behind Kickstart.ds. Um, before we worked on Kickstart.ds, I worked on websites mainly, interface, app design since 2005, so some years already. And before even that, I studied computer science in Bonn. What is Kickstart.ds, you might ask? So just the quick quick uh, summary, Kickstart.ds is a starter kit for design systems. So basically something your team, your digital team can use to create your own design system. So it's not a ready-made solution you just buy and use directly, but something you use as building blocks to create your own custom design system that's really tailored to your own needs. Oh. So a quick summary that we always use is a low-code framework and comprehensive component library enabling digital teams to create consistent and brand compliant web front and super efficiently. Lots of words, but I hope it will be understood. Um, so what do I want to talk about today? Um, what I want to show is how good components, that would be the Kickstart.ds part and Sanity, that would be the CMS part of what I show, enable the development of custom editor interfaces, something we're really passionate about. And we did this with just three devs and just three weeks. So bunch of threes here. So who was the customer? The customer was Encore, which is a spin-off of a large energy supply company, utility company in Germany. Um, they wanted to, or they are building digital platforms and an ecosystem for the energy market here in Germany mainly um, that is used to enable companies that have complex products and services to simplify their own processes and how they work with all those services and how they sell them. They are also official partner of SAP and PowerCloud and have apps listed on their marketplaces. So they're pretty well connected on that part too. The project itself was about creating specialized sales journeys. So they always need to sell their, their services to customers and want to have real real flexibility in doing that. And that means that they want to freely mix custom content with structured blocks like asking for your zip code or stuff like that that's needed to find the correct correct uh, offer for you. Um, and that what they really wanted was a seamless editing experience, which gives the user all the control and freedom, which is also one of the important usability heuristics by Nielsen Norman. I think it's number three, right? Another three, three threes now. <laughs> Yeah, and what they wanted is also consistency over all of that. So all the CMS content and all those structured blocks should all share the same layout and design in the end. So the user will not be confused when using the product. Um, they also wanted support for different display modes for those journeys. I'll get to what a journey really is. I think that could be a bit abstract right now, but they wanted to have dis different display modes for those. And they also need multi-tenancy and white labeling because they sell those this solution that we've worked on to different German energy companies that have their own different look and feel, for example. So they also needed customizability for those tenants. So one tenant might want to have a specific block that's styled differently or even a whole different way of displaying such a user journey. So let's just get to it, to the interesting part, I think. So what we're starting here is the login to the back end of the whole solution, which is not an XJS app. This is a Rails app we're looking at. Um, so I have to choose a service and I have to switch to a different tenant right here, which has journeys configured already. So what I'm seeing here is a list of journeys. This is still the Rails app. Um, and I want to show two in specific. That is one, where is it? This one. I just opened the front end part first. So you always have such a page that is at the start of a journey. So you can add some 
content, really connecting to the user, showing him how, why he should start this journey. And it's, it always has a button to, to start the journey itself. So I just click this and I get into the journey. So we have a small header and a bunch of steps, they are called. So every journey consists of steps. And those are the first part that the editor can choose himself. So he really has full control over how many steps, how many blocks per step, and so on. So I can go through here. And I have to mention, all of this is in German, so sorry about that. Um, I try to explain what I'm doing. I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but um, otherwise, just ask in the chat. Um, so yeah, I can go through here. I will not do the whole whole thing, but you get the point. I can go through here. And in the end, when I send it, I get to a small page that says, great, you're, it, this was successful, um, and you get the, the information. So all of this, what you've seen, should be controllable by the editor in the end. To show you what I meant with different display modes for journeys, I can open this one, for example. It also has such a page at the start. And if I go into the journey, I see this version, which is a slider version. So also here, I can take some selections. For example, those products are pulled from a PIM system, product inventory management solution. I can choose such a wall box, for example. I can enter my zip code. Let's click quickly click through here to get to the end. So really flexible, lots of content mixed with structured stuff. In the end, I get a summary for all of this, and I can send it again. And I see this page again. Yeah, so this is pretty much what the user would see when using such a journey made by an editor. So let's jump into the really interesting part, the editor part. So when I click on Edit here, you see that this opens. And this is the Next.js app that we've talked about. So it's a React app and using Next.js in the background. And it's running on top of this Rails backend. When I push Leave, I'll just be back here. So. I can click into and out of it, but let's keep in here. So basically, you have three tabs up here, which correspond to the general settings of such a journey, which is Strecke in Deutsch uh, for journey. Um, you have the structure of a journey, which consists of all the steps. So I can close all those. And you see that those are quite a lot. And in each step, there are a lot, bunch of blocks. But quickly back to the general settings. So what you can do here is give it a name. You can change the display mode, which can be on one page, which is the first journey we saw. It can be one step per page. And it can be slider, which is the one we just looked at. And additionally, you can choose a, a start and a confirmation page. So. This is where it gets interesting, because already here, you can see you can select from a bunch of pages. And those are all sanity documents in the background. And I can even go in here and say, OK, I want to change maybe this page. And I get an embedded version of the studio right next to a live preview of it. So I could go in here, and maybe I want to make it really important. So I could go into this headline and just add a bunch more exclamation marks in real time, too. So I can quickly go in here and configure the complete page as an editor. Oh, too many scroll bars here. I can publish, and I can leave again. So where it gets really interesting is if I go into such a step, like, for example, this one here, the first one, I have the name of a step. I can choose between all those steps right here. And I can see all the blocks that are part of this step. So for example, this, the first step, is a combination of a free content, which is the first one, and a workflow choice. So a workflow choice has effect on the way the next button, for example, could work. 
Um, but the interesting here, the thing here for sanity would be the first one, the free content again. So I can edit it and I see here, I have some general settings, for example, this headline here, which is displayed at the top. I can choose some generic stuff like the spacing before and after, or I could even make this dark or inverted. Those are settings that are there for all the blocks, sanity content blocks and structured blocks. And finally, I can choose from the contents themselves, which are those here. Those are also pulled from Sanity. Those are documents, not the same type as the pages we saw before. But for example, I could switch to that video content here, and it automatically updates inside the preview too. So you have a mixed preview with those structured blocks. For example, this one is one that's right in here. So I could also maybe add an exclamation mark here. It also gets live updated. So it's a mixed live preview of the sanity content and the content of the journey itself. I can also, when I'm here, go directly into the content. So like we saw for the page before, I can jump into here and just quickly go, for example, here. And let's, for example, Say we want to have that box on the lower left instead. That would be this. Or maybe I want a different background. I'm not sure that's doing anything right now. Oh, because uh, the color is set here. I could remove this. Yeah. So it's really easy to go in here and create the content you like. You can even go in here and let me do that maybe. Create a new block say free content, maybe quickly show that again. We have lots of different blocks, um, create a new free content, and I can create a new content from here too. So I could say I want to have a new content, and I can choose from a bunch of components that are part of kickstart.ds. This is where our part or component part comes into the picture, and I can, for example, to the visual, which is a big element having a background image. Um, maybe that's too complex. Let's choose something easier. Remove this again. But you see, it's really seamless. It's just embedded alongside the other stuff here. Let's choose a text media, for example. And I can put text in here. this again, choose the content, and it should be, where is it? Here it is, yeah. Maybe go into here again to show how it's actually updating. But everything is live updated here. That works great. So I can close that again. I can go into here and rearrange those ones as I'd like. I can jump to the different steps and choose other stuff here. So it's really flexible for the editor. And he never leaves this interface, which is really nice for the editing experience. Um, we have some other stuff that's cool in here too. Like you can, let me show that. For example, show product information. And when you use this one, let's put it to the top so we actually see it updating. you see a bunch of products that are pulled from the product inventory management system. So for example, I could use this one and I get a preview of that content, which in this case is a wall box, which makes sense for your energy utility company. Um, yeah, I can also pull up the, the preview from here. Um, maybe one thing to add, I think I need to refresh before because it's saved in the background. Um, one interesting thing is everything I do in the interface right here can be done, uh, can be, you can use undo and redo to uh, make, uh, to revert changes, for example. I could maybe take this one, order it up here. I could go into the settings and change the name, even the type, for example. So all of this can be 
undone and redone, which is really nice for the editor and speaks to the to the kind of UI we wanted to build, which doesn't really allow the editor to make make mistakes or lasting mistakes. Let's call it like that. So you see here, it jumps back and forth. So this is really nice to, to have a safe and editing environment, which we think is really important for editors to feel empowered in the end. So let me think about other stuff right here. I think that is mainly this part. You can copy the state of such a journey complete with all the stuff in it. So you could send it to a colleague of yours so he could use it as a baseline to start. Or you could have your catalog of journeys saved that you pull from when creating new journeys, for example. Those are the ideas that are in play here. I also have to say this is pretty early. So it's in use for the first client, I think, but it's really, really early. So we're just start, we've start, just started to build this. Um, and we think it's really impressive already. You also have different modes for dark mode and not dark mode. Let me think. Yeah, maybe one thing to show off, I think that would be the last thing too. Um, we also saw thought about the ways that those teams work because that did not work. Why did that not work? Okay. Ah, I'm not sure why did this did not work. Because you can just go into the interface, the Sanity Studio itself to let me see from history maybe. No, it's not working anymore. That's unfortunate. Maybe it's in here somewhere. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure I can show that then. But we have a full studio too, because you have those teams are most of the time the teams have different roles in them. So one person would be the one creating actual journeys, whereas the content team maybe would be the one working on the contents. So let's see, maybe I can get to it from here. I maybe I'll just... Uh, Add a screenshot of it into the meetup chat later. Yeah, not sure why this is not working. That worked before. Yeah, this is the API, but that's not the part I was interested in. Ah, okay, I think I have it. Let me just quickly reverse engineer that. Yes, okay, here we go. So this would be the full studio. So you have the free contents I've shown you before. So you could just create them from here too. So this could be a different team just working on the content, whereas the main team would be working on the journeys and just connects the journey up to the content that's created by the content team in the back end. OK, good that this did work in the end. And that's pretty much it. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to, to ask them. Oh, this is the first time again. Yeah, thanks for listening. Wow, thanks for that talk. Um, it, so I'm used to seeing the studio a certain way, you know, not embedded in another app. And so it took me a while to realize, oh, that's the studio right there. <laughs> that's a really cool, like, I don't know, just the design. It seemed very, like, intuitive, very seamless. Let me unshare. Um, yeah, and there's quite a few uh, mind-blown emojis in the, in the chat here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really seamless. That's why we chose that for the title, too, because we think that's the really impressive part about it, because the editor never has to leave his interface. He can always stay in it. He always has live previews. So it's really nice what you can do with uh, Sanity V3 already. So yeah, 
That's amazing. Um, so we do have a couple questions from the community. Yeah. Cody um, asked, are you using next-sanity slash studio for embedding V3? Yes, uh, we use that and a bunch of other stuff too, because the previews, I think, are just regular old Grok queries running for the draft or non-draft versions of the documents. So you could also have, as a user, the page open in the journey. And when, in the background, the editor publishes a new version of the content, it would live update for the user, which is also pretty funky, at least, we think. <laughs> Right on. But yeah, for, then, the, for the connection part, the embedding part, we use the Next Sanity, I think, is the project on GitHub, too. Right on. And then um, Magnus Holm, one of our speakers today, um, asked, some of the data, so like the general settings, was edited outside of the studio in the Next app. Is this stored outside of Sanity? And if so, are you planning on moving it to Sanity later? Not entirely sure if we want to move it to Sanity later. Right now, it's stored in the Rails backend in a pretty, let's say, structured way. We have a JSON schema that describes the structure of this whole thing, and it gets saved into the Rails backend, which can do stuff like upgrades and stuff like that. Um, we've not thought about that really that much. Um, We've really focused on the content part for Sanity, because one thing we always see for clients is this basic need to be able to combine their structured stuff with freeform content. And that's really a, a huge, huge problem for lots of teams that have to switch systems. They have to have a different tab open for their content. They have to know how to connect it. And this is really so much better with this approach, we think. Yeah. Uh, it's well, really impressive, that's for sure. Yeah. And then we have one more question. I'll let Mar yeah. Martin take that one. All right, let's see. Uh, yeah, um, so seeing as uh, V3 is still in a dev preview phase, is there have you found any dragons that you would caution people about if they were to start using I mean, V3? I don't think so. I mean, we did some, I would say, hacky stuff to get it looking like that, like you saw. So for example, you, you maybe stumbled upon the missing header information for the Embedded Studio, which would be why you maybe not directly recognize it. Um, we just disabled that with pretty hard important statements in CSS. So that would be one thing. And we had some trouble. I'm not sure if we still have it with image uploads. So I'm not too sure that image uploads currently work completely fine from inside the Embedded Studio part. I think it's related to the URL, URL handling. So that would be gotchas that we had, but those were, were very minor, I'd say. All right. Right on. Uh, There's a yeah. couple more questions. I think we can, yeah, let's just get them. Um, I was going to say, yeah. So there's a question from Ethan. So is content running in Studio V2 and Journey Editor running in V3? I think it's all V3. I, I don't oh. know if you could mix that. I'm not sure, actually, yeah. but it should be all V3. To be OK, cool. And then one more Are you from Keisha. Are you using MongoDB on the back end with Rails or Postgres SQL with JSONB? I think it's Postgres, but uh, don't quote me on that. That's not the part we've actually worked on. So basically, okay. what you saw with the Rails backend, and when I clicked on Edit to get into the Next.js app, the blue one, <laughs> Um, that was the the point that we took over. So we just built the the app that's bootstrapped from there. So it's a React app that gets started in the browser, and we had a, an API definition. I think when debugging the full blown studio, you shortly saw the Open API definition for that. So we just have an Open API contract between the front end and back end that really tells us how to structure the stuff that gets saved. But that was not directly our job. Yeah. Cool. Um, great stuff. Great demo. Great project. It all and looks really awesome. If you have more really questions, awesome. I'll hop over into the chat too. So just feel yeah. free to out there. Yeah, definitely go ahead on over to the chat. There's a lot of um, like, yeah, mind blown emojis being thrown <laughs> around. This is this was very cool. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, if you want to follow Jonas on Twitter, you we just put the um, the link for Jonas's Twitter in the chat. And if you have more questions for Jonas, you know where to find with that link. And then, yeah, 
Thank you so much, Jonas, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, Thank you so much. Was a joy.